welcome to Chameleon with Remy Adeleki. What a beautiful name, Remy Adeleki. I'm Amanda Olke. I'm the Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, tonight. We're so pleased to have Remy with us to discuss his new spy thriller, Chameleon, and his really fascinating career in the Navy as a SEAL and then follow-up career, which is incredible too. So Remy is a former Navy SEAL. After leaving the Navy in 2016, he wrote an acclaimed memoir, Transformed, and has had featured roles in the film Plane and Fox's Special Forces, World's Toughest Test, among many other cool acting gigs. Chameleon is his first book in a new thriller series featuring Nigerian-born and New York-raised Kali Kent and the top secret Black Box program. Now, Remy is going to do an overview of Chameleon. We, won't, we don't want to do too many spoilers, but he'll do an overview and read a brief passage. Then I'm going to ask him some questions since I had the pleasure of reading the book already. And I wasn't lying when I said we have called this our recommended spy beach read because I read it at the beach last week and it, it was fantastic. I could enjoy the beach and also be transported into this intense thriller world. So to keep the beach vibe going and to be a little bit cheesy, I have coaxed Remy into joining me in an evening cheers. Now I've got a grapefruit crush. What do you got over there, Remy? I have an Izzy. He's got an Izzy. Uh, so cheers out. to you. Cheers to you too. <laughs> cheers to you. Thanks for being with us. Now you're gonna have questions. And as a reminder, when you do, please just use the Q&A and we will get to as many of them as we can. And he's happy to answer about the acting career, the naval career, the SEAL career, the book. So just to kick it off, I will disappear for a little bit and turn this over to the star, Remy. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so as far as Chameleon, Chameleon, I won't go into too much about how it got to came about because I know we'll get to that later, but in short, it follows Kali Khalif Browder Kent. Uh, he's part of a, a top secret CIA program called Black Box. Within Black Box, uh, there are spies with different specializations. Uh, you have chameleons, which Kali is a chameleon. We're kicking off the franchise with chameleon. And chameleons are able to become whatever character they need to become at the drop of the dime. It's grounded in reality. Um, they're just really, really great actors. And the idea kind of came to me um, years ago when I was overseas, where I had to become a chameleon, uh, depending on who I was in front of. If I was in front of a one source who uh, was often scared, I had to be uh, have, have a certain persona for him. Or another source, I had to different, have a different persona for another source and so on and so forth. And so chameleons can become whatever character they need to become. They're really well-trained actors. Then you have ghost agents who, are, who augment chameleons and they're people who are able to get into uh, places uh, like a ghost, in and out of places and plant themselves places. Then you have aberration agents who are a combination of both chameleons and ghosts, but they go under deep cover for decade, decade plus. And then you have win agents, which are vehicle experts. And there's so many other programs, but the book really focuses on those four. And, 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 and within a team, within a black box team, the name of the black box team that Kali leads is called Dark Horse. And uh, they're on a mission to essentially find out the identity of a, uh, uh, a South African former special operations uh, guy who is carrying out um, a hostage gambit. Essentially, he's manipulating the worldwide stock markets by taking people of high influence and depending on on their on their wealth or depending on whether it be beneficial to give them back or kill them. He's doing that and he's uh, manipulating the stock markets in that way and, and in other ways as well. I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do the traditional nuclear bomb or the uh, you know the uh, the villain who has the 
the MacGuffin that we need to get to save the world. I wanted to do something uh, different. And so Kali and his team set out to go find this guy and bring him uh, to justice before not only he continues his gambit, but he partners with another entity to essentially cause uh, economic an economic collapse from around the world. So uh, instead of this being uh, modern warfare or uh, chemical warfare, this is economic warfare. So I'm that's my brief overview. I'm sure I'll be able to get into more uh, into better details uh, when Amanda jumps back on. But I am going to read uh, a brief uh, part of uh, chapter uh, 22, uh, excuse me, 33. And in this chapter, um, Kali is actually meeting with Van Groot in person. What inspired this chapter was the movie Heat. Heat is one of my favorite movies. And I love the scene uh, when Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, Al Pacino being the hero and Robert De Niro being the villain, they come to a restaurant and sit face to face and have a conversation. And so being a filmmaker myself and really wanting to see that scene come to fruition in a different way, I wrote a variation of that scene where Kali meets with the antagonist of the book in a nice restaurant in the Bahamas. Maybe not quite as exotic as where Amanda was on vacation, but I would say similar. So, so let's jump in. I won't read the whole thing. I was in Ocean City, Maryland, so I, I think that Kali really, and Lucas had me beat on the exotic factor. All right, there you go, there you go. Uh, yeah, it definitely beats uh, Maryland Beach, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Van Groot was just about to give up and leave when his eyes caught a man approaching his table from the right. The tall black man was dressed in a blue linen suit as fine as Van Groot's. He stopped directly opposite Van Groot and looked down at him. It looks like your date stood you up, Mr. Van Groot, said Kali. Mind if I join you? Over at the bar, Van Groot's bodyguard started to rise from his stool. Jason's hand moved toward the Glock under his jacket. Van Groot squinted up at Kali, but he didn't say anything. He just opened a palm toward the opposite chair. Kali nodded, pulled it out, and sat down. Van Groot's bodyguard settled back onto his stool, and so did Jason. The maitre of the uh, appeared at the table again, looking embarrassed and frustrated. I'm sorry, sir, he said to Van Groot as he looked again at his table. I believe you were waiting for a Mrs. Samantha. No, it's quite all right, my friend, Van Groot said. It's actually Sam, not Samantha, Kali said to the maitre d'. Must have been looking, must have been, book, uh, excuse me, must have been a booking error. Yes, of course, the maitre d' said, relieved. Drinks then, gentlemen? I'll have a gin and tonic, Van Group said. Tangere with a twist. Sounds like a taste of summer, Kali said. I'll have the same. The maitre d' left a pair of menus on the table along with a wine list and walked away. Neither man spoke for a minute. They looked at each other like mountain cats of different species, suddenly locked in the same cage. So, to what do I owe this pleasure, the mate? Van Group finally said. I thought it was time to get acquainted, Kali said. He considered offering Van Groot a handshake, but it would be too obvious and too early. Are we old school chums? Van Groot titled his, tilted his head. No, you're too young and your face isn't familiar. We're in the same business, Kali said, at opposite ends of the spectrum. I see, Van Groot nodded slowly. The maitre d' returned with the drinks, company by a waiter. Have you gentlemen decided what you'll be having, he asked. Not yet, mate, Van Groot said without taking his eyes off Kali. We're just catching up. The two servers withdrew. Van Groot reached across the table, took Kali's gin and tonic, pushed his drink across the table to Kali and smiled. Cheers, he said, taking a long sip. Kali did the same. At the bar, Jason casually turned his head so he could see Kali's right hand. The Prada glasses had digital lenses sensitive to microwave transmissions. He could see the nanoparticles in Kali's palm patch turning from green to yellow. We've got about another two minutes, he murmured. Back at the table, so you're a government stiff of some sort, Van Group smirked at Kali. US, I assume. Not stiff, extremely flexible. Well, let's see, mate. Van Groot perused the rat in ceiling. K 
can't be DEA because those blokes can't work overseas unless it's a drug-related matter. NSA stays in their nerd hooches. FBI is domestic unless I happen to be wanted on an international basis, which I'm not. He looked back at Kylie and smiled. That leaves only landed. The purveyors of illegal crews around the world. We do other things on occasion, Kali said, confirming Van Groot's CIA guess without actually saying it. Ah, the men who killed JFK, Van Groot sneered. You read to you read to me, you read to me as too smart for conspiracy theory, Lucas. Van Groot took another swig of his drink. I see we're on a first name basis, he said. What's yours? Or the cover name you're using today? Abasi. African, it's a respectable name. I'm a respectable man, Kali said. Van Groot leaned closer, his green eyes gleaming. You're also out of your league, Abbasi. You've got nothing on me. Both you and I know that's the reason you're here. And I'll just stop it there because the conversation gets deeper and it, it, and, and, and it becomes more of a duel of uh, dialogue and uh, so on and so forth, but you'll be able to get the rest of it and you'll be able to find out how this antagonist and our protagonist ended up in this place and what is going to happen afterwards after you get the book and read it. <laughs> and I mean, that is such a, a pivotal scene, um, but there are so many, uh, there are just so many incredibly intense scenes in different places. You're really around the world in this. So I'll, I'll get to some of those different locations, but you can can kind of feel the ice in those drinks and this annoying bait, you know, Lucas Van Groot just being so arrogant. But let's talk about Kali Ken first. Your main character, he is a Nigerian born operative. He's incredibly capable and tough. And as he said, flexible, and he is very flexible with identities and, uh, and really quite amazing. So Remy, how much of Kent is you? How much how is it? How do you two diverge? Tell us a little bit about about what qualifies you to write about this incredible guy that you no, come up you. with. I would say, you know, there's a book right behind me right there pointing to called Transform. It's a little book that uh, covers my life, my big crazy life. And I've been saying lately that Chameleon is a fictional extension of Transform. So all of the things that I couldn't talk about in Transform because of my background being in human intelligence, these are some of the things I was able to some very fictionalize <laughs> a lot to protect you know, the secrets and so, so on and so forth, fictionalize to create this world. And so Kali is me and I am Kali. Instead of it's being, you know, having, you know, R-E-M-I, it's K-A-L-I. And, uh, uh, you know, Kali is from Nigeria, just like I'm from Nigeria. His background is a little bit different as, you know, my father was, a, was an engineer and he engineered one of the first man-made islands in the world. And the Nigerian government came in and stripped my father of, of, of that island. And we went from rich to poor. My mother brought us to the States. As you know, from reading the book, Kali's uh, story is very similar, but not quite the same, you know? Just like I grew up in New York City, Kali did. And just like I rose up through the ranks going from a kid in the hood, selling drugs, doing a lot of nefarious things that I shouldn't be doing to being, to working, not just in special operations, but with three letter agencies sometimes, Kali has followed that trajectory. So everything that I, uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, everything that I, I aspire to be, everything I really couldn't talk about, everything that, aspects of my life that I, that I found cool and maybe if I could fictionalize in a sense, uh, and one day I would, that's Kyle. That, well, <laughs> we won't, you know, we don't want to spoil it. There's so much we can talk about without spoiling it. But the um, the African piece, there's, you know, a, a Genesis piece that runs through this about young Kali Ken. And um, it is so interesting to read about Nigeria and that time. And here's, I'll tell you, and when other people read it, I didn't see how you were gonna tie it together. And I was very surprised. So I'll put that teaser out for folks. 
the the African storyline comes in, in in quite an amazing, amazing way. Okay, so Kali Kent is part of a black box team and you've given us some background on all of these teammates that have varied expertise from transportation to stealth and surveillance. And then I was, um, you've mentioned yourself as being a chameleon, but are, are there people who really are um, sort of known chameleons in real life with, with, can you tell us about that or this process? Process. It's really interesting the process that you chose for them to become other people. And is that something that came out of maybe your new life and in entertainment, or did you have that already? Well, it's, I would say it's a combination of both. There are there are you know there are three letter agencies, and there are people that work within those three letter agencies that do have to, to do go undercover under aliases and, and cover names and so on and so forth. So they have to be different people. I mean, even at a local level, that we, we call them undercover cops, <laughs> right? who, you know, who have to, I was actually text messaging with an undercover cop earlier today, but right before he was getting ready to get into character to uh, set up a drug bust. And so, you know, this is something that is real and evident and it is something to a certain extent that I had to do as I touched on earlier. You know, I went to various human intelligence schools and uh, I learned tradecraft, learned how to run sources in the agency world. They're known as assets in our world. We know them as sources in the policing world they are known as informants. And so a part of that is you have to know your source, but you also have to know how to communicate to that source. And you can't really be you. And you can't be the same person with every source because every source has a different personality, has different motivations, and has different expectations. And so you have to learn how to become what you need to become to get the job done. So that part of it, I did pull from my past experiences and mm -hmm. other experiences of people operating in that world. But the fictitious part of it, I can't say that I, I have met or know of any CIA agent, case officer who has a specific process of getting into character. Um, that kind of came to me uh, at, when I went to method acting school. So um, after I finished grad school, I and got into the film and TV business, I wanted to learn my craft a bit more. So I went to the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute in LA. And I had a teacher in my improv class, a wonderful woman named MJ Parney. And she had this process, she, get, she, taught, she had a process of how she would get into character. And I'll never forget, I'm in class one day and she's like, why is it so hard for you all to cry? It should be hard for an actor to cry. An actor should be able to cry. And she said, watch me. And she literally goes through this process. She takes her hand, starts up here, and she rubs her hand from the top of her forehead all the way down. And by the time her fingers leave her past her eyes, she's bawling, crying. Oh my gosh. And I found that so fascinating. And then wow. she, she, she mentioned to us, it's important that you have a trinket or you have something that is connected to uh, maybe a, a, an event that happened to you in your past or some pain or trauma that you went through. And, and, and so that you can use that to tap in, to remind your body because your body is an instrument. So to remind your body of how you felt the last time you held that object, to help you get into character or to help you cry, to help you do whatever you need to do. And so I learned that in, in, in method acting the school. So fast forward to when it was time to you know write the screenplay because as we said, okay, it started out as a screenplay. I knew it. Anytime any chameleon, whether it's Kali or anybody else gets into, uh, has to get into character, there's a process of it. Just like a chameleon gradually blends into the color that it needs to become in order to, you know, hide from its, from its, from predators or from, from its enemies, you know, Kali going through this process is him gradually blending into that character that he needs to become. So that part is fictitious. I mean, it might be real, but I don't know. <laughs> no, I like, and, and you gave a good, you also explained why they were inspired to use the method. It, it all came together. It was very, very interesting. So I, I love that. And then this team, this very diverse team in terms of their expertise and their backgrounds, 
have you experienced that sort of team before? Is that part of the world you came from with different strengths? 100%, you know, in, uh, in my community, it's called the SEAL teams. <laughs> Every SEAL unit ends with the word team. We have a saying in our community, there are no Johnny Rambos. But, you know, everybody know who Johnny Rambo is. He takes out all the bad guys by himself, saves the world by himself. He does everything by himself. We can't afford to have that. In order for uh, us to be successful, each person has to operate within their expertise and with their, within their specialty. So a sniper has to be a, a, a sniper. You know, me, I was a medic, but I was also a human guy. I had to do my job. And if all of us did our job, then our team as a whole would succeed. And so, you know, that's why I wanted to, Kali is the centerpiece of the team and he is the protagonist of the book. But I didn't want to have this one person, and this is not a hit on other espionage books or other you know uh films or tv shows with or with jason Bourne or you know or uh james bond saving the day by himself but i wanted it to be authentic and real to the fact that it takes a team to save the day to 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 protect the nation it takes a team and so that's kind of where it came out of it came out of this team needs individuals within it with specific specialties and that's its strength. Sort of like the Spartans, you know? What made the Spartans so good wasn't one guy with a shield. It was the fact that all of those guys, uh, when they locked shields together, they were able to protect everyone uh, to their right, their left, and, and behind them. And you care, I, I mean, you care when you're reading about the book. You care about these other team members and what's going on with them and some things you you might suspect about them or, or worries you might have so so they were um they were valuable characters that was very, very interesting so but you mentioned you former navy seal so did you have to brush up on different types of intel agency activities to write chameleon or have you participated in enough cross three-letter agency <laughs> operations to just conjure this up? Yeah, you know, it was all stuff that was, um, it was stuff that had been in my head, stuff that I'd known, but obviously I wanted, I needed to change things, you know, to protect, you know, how we operate and what we do. So, you know, I, you know, again, you know, some subtle changes such as, you know, that using the emblem to get into character or, or names or terms or certain things, but it was, it all came natural, you know? And again, and again, a big part of it was, you know, the screenplay had been written, but even there's other projects that I have written as well that keep my mind current. And then there's movies and TV shows, as you know, that I've worked on or consulted on that has kept me current as well. So that when I, you know, when I'm come back to the table, it's like even working on the TV show, Special Forces Fox, there were certain things that on that show that you know, reminded me of certain TTPs or certain things that I have to do in order to make sure that the show is, is good and but to make sure that it's safe. And so all of these things that I do, whether it's unscripted, scripted writing, it keeps me current and it keeps me uh, reminded of what's real, what's not, and most importantly, what's real, but how can I bend it a little bit to protect what's out there, but still tell a cool and authentic story. So and you just protect, said, without, protect our secrets and protect our TTP. Right. So you said TTP. What do you mean? Uh, tactics, training, and procedures. Now, you do a great job in the novel of explaining things like that. Yeah. You will throw out acronyms. You will throw out jargon. But you always, there are things I knew because I've had 20 years at the Spy Museum but there are things I certainly didn't know and you can't know everything all the time. So it, it really was nice. It, it made the reader feel like they were inside the world, but they didn't have to like quickly Google something. Yeah. And so what I want to ask you is, you know, we have lots of folks that we talk to that are former CIA. And yeah. when they write a book like this, they it has to go through the publications review board at the CIA. Is there anything like that um, for Navy SEALs, for people yeah. such as yourself? Yep. Every book that a SEAL writes has to go through the, uh, the uh, I should have it on my computer because I have been through this process with the books, but goes to the DOD and they screen it and they come back and say, hey, you got to take this out, take this out. And the cool thing is, you know, again, Transform helped me a lot with this process. 
because it was an eight month process for Transformed. And when I got it back, there were only two things they made me take out. DIA, oh, wow. DIA, uh, and they made me take out JSOC. And this is a this is a this is a hundred and twenty seven thousand word book, and, and 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 though they only made me take it out in one place, each each of those two terms, those acronyms in one place, so that really helped prepare me for this one, where I was just like, okay, I know what to stay away from. I'm just going to write the book in a similar fashion fashion as I wrote Transform, where I water things down, change things, or I don't go into you know certain details and stuff like that, and then also you know um, have other other people vet it as well, and then submit it and have an easy process. Yeah, but it's still it's still a long process. Now, did you um, did you get anything in that you're surprised about either in the new um, the new thriller or in Transformed? they let anything slip that you were surprised about? Yeah. Well, yeah, I was surprised uh, when it, as it relates to Transformed, I was surprised about the, the, the JSOC piece and the DIA piece. I was surprised. I was really surprised because, uh, um, Again, those are just acronyms. It's not going into detail about. Oh, but did did you get anything in that you thought they were going to cut? I was at, oh. asking the flip. Oh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. No, uh, no, no. Uh, I was like, I was like, we are not, we were not oh. singing. Yeah, I was wondering, oh. did um, did did anything get in? Because I've had authors say yeah. to me, I never thought they'd let us put thus and so in. No, um, no, because I again, I was, yeah, there was nothing that surprised me that they kept in. Oh. Well, you, it sounds like you, you figured out the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, uh, in Black, Black Box has this really impressive floating command center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, is that just a fever dream? How did you come up with that, Remy? You know, uh, uh, I wanted to, again, I wanted to do something different. I, I, I and then also, Partly being in the military and knowing that air, that's what air, aircraft carriers, you know, float across the Pacific and also the Atlantic and support of other stuff. I was like, what if the Black Box headquarters wasn't a building? What if it was just a ship? <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. I loved it. It's different. Yeah, that's different. And, and you know, and, and in part um, because the screenplay is actually a sequel to the book. So the book is a prequel to the screenplay. Oh. So book two will actually be an adaptation of the screenplay. And in book two, there is no shit. So something will happen at some point, uh, uh, you know, without giving away too much, something right. will happen at some point to that ship. So, so I, I wanted to, because I knew how things were gonna play out in book two, I wanted to establish the headquarters in book one so that when things go the way they go in book two, you know, uh, there was- well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that headquarters. I also, um, you know, you did, you really definitely wanted to make things different. You already touched on, um, you wanted this to be a, an economic plot. There are other, you know, that was really exciting. I did not see that coming. What made you choose to make Van Groot, Van Groot South African? You know, characters just come out of me. <laughs> so I know it's a weird thing as a writer or a screenwriter. Like I just start get to talk. I, I start talking as I write and I just start saying dialogue. And then I get influences from other villains from other movies and stuff like that. Or not even villains, maybe protagonists that would have been a cool uh, villain. And, and then it just, the character just comes out of me. I didn't go into this process saying I wanted I wanted the villain to be from South Africa. I wanted the villain's name to be Van Groot. I had a sense of who he who he was. I could kind of see him, visualize him. And then as for me, I'm a character over plot writer. For me, ah. I, I'd rather character drive plot than plot drive drive the character. And so once I as I build these characters in the process then they begin to tell me what they would say. How would, how would they react? 
you know, what they're thinking based off of the different attributes that I gradually over time, you know, molded his character to be. And so that, like, it wasn't something that was uh, pre pre planned. It was something that gradually kind of came out. And I was like, I went back. and then I went back and I was like, uh, uh, and uh, a few chapters back after I got, you know, after I finally figured him out, after I finally fully built him out, I can't remember what chapter it was. And I, that's when I went back, like, all right, he's going to be South African. His name's going to be Van Groot, X, Y, and Z. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, so you've told, we were talking beforehand and you've mentioned the interesting process for this book, which as I read it felt very cinematic. And there's a reason for that, which you tell, tell us a little bit about the genesis of the book as a screenplay and, and that process. Yeah, so um, after I got out of the military, I was in grad school getting my master's in organizational strategy and my plan was to go into business consulting full time. My brother-in-law is a YPO, which stands for Young Presidents Organization. Uh, and in order to get in, you have to be a millionaire, a billionaire, and under the age of 40, there's chapters all around the world. And so he was getting me a lot of consulting jobs via his YPO partners and friends and his companies. And so that was my plan. Fast forward to May of, I got out in January, 2016. Fast forward to May of 2016, I met my, pay, at my, uh, uh, desk writing papers for school uh, and I get a phone call from a woman who works for Michael Bay and she's looking for somebody with my background of special operations to consult on transformers and you know help make it authentic more authentic and real but also active and so I had no desire to be in Hollywood I had no desire to be a storyteller I would, but I was open to the opportunity and I went and one day turned into three weeks three weeks turned into six months and I ended up getting bumped the cast through the Michigan film, Arizona, London, Wales, film all over the place. And then it was after that, that I began to fully understand the power of film and story. And that's when my gear shifted from being a business consultant to wanting to be a storyteller. And after working on Transform, excuse me, on Transformers, more opportunities started to arise. I got approached, somebody heard my story, actually Kathy Lee Gifford uh, heard my story and told me, you need to write a book, your story is incredible, it's inspirational. And so I got a book deal with HarperCollins, uh, uh, Harper, Harper, HarperCollins in 2017, I wanna say. And then I wrote the book and after I wrote that book, that's when I was like, I wanna, I wanna write, I wanna learn how to write screenplays because I would get these consulting job offers and I would get the scripts and I would read these scripts. And I was like, oh, like, this is like, I could write better than this. And like, I, you know, I could write more real, I could write with more passion. And, this. And, uh, and, and so I said, I'm going to teach myself screenwriting. So I taught myself screenwriting. I got the masterclass subscription and took Aaron Sorkin's masterclass and, uh, 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 Shonda Rhimes masterclass and David Mamet's masterclass. And then I took some other uh, YouTube channels and, 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 and assimilated everything that they had. And that's when I wrote my first screenplay, which was Chameleon. And, uh, and then after I wrote Chameleon, I wrote another screenplay called The Last Shall Be First, which is a true story about the first group of African-Americans to serve in special operations. And there's a, there's a CIA component to that as well, because the CIA got together with the army and because we were getting crushed in, in, in the Korean War. And they said, we need to create a, we need to fight unconventional warfare. Well, unconventional warfare is gonna take an unconventional unit. And that's kind of how this unit was stood up. And so I wrote that film. And then those two screenplays got me a, a, a writing job that got me into the WGA and then I, as I mentioned with Chameleon, that script got picked up, went through a year of rewrites on that script that got picked up by a major production company. And after that year of rewrites, we started shopping the screenplay to a studio to buy it. Well, we, we started looking to package the screenplay with a director because the budget was $80 million. And so, but there's only a handful of directors in Hollywood who a studio will allow to manage an $80 million budgeted film. And so all the directors we went to, I, we love it. I love the script, but I'm tied up for the next two years. I'm tied up for the next four years. I'm tied up for the next six years. And so it was at that point where I said, you know what, screw it. I'm going to teach myself how to direct because I'd rather be in a position where I can write something and then direct it and not have to worry about trying to beg or find or petition a director to make my movie. 
And so, and it was around that same time that I met Taylor Moore, who also used to work for the agency, Taylor turned author. He wrote a book called Downrange, read the script, and then he said, hey, this needs to be a book series. And so he walked the screenplay to his agent. His agent read the script, said, Taylor's right, this needs to be a book series. And then we created a bidding war. Well, he created a bidding war and we went with HarperCollins, William Murrow. But it was also in that time where I was continuing to learn directing and I directed my first film, short film, a 32 minute short film, which is on YouTube now. It's called The Unexpected. It's based on true events about an international organ harvesting ring. And it's so interesting but to see how a lot of these organ harvesting rings and human trafficking and drug smuggling rings, they operate almost, they're intelligence units, you know, they mm -hmm. in a very sophisticated manner. And so I made that film, put it on YouTube. That film got picked up to be a feature film, big $35 million budgeted film. We're going into production after the writer's strike. Hopefully we get some waivers. We applied for some waivers today to go in production. But that's kind of how it all came about as far as my, my storytelling um, uh, story. Just, just amazing. So... Who's going to, you know, if you're going to, are you going to direct it, but who's going to play Kali Kent? Ah, that's a great question. You know, there's a lot of, you know, I've had uh, producers reach out to me and they say, I know this actor would drop everything to play this right. role. Right. You, know? Um, you know, I think John Boyega would be fantastic. Um, uh, uh, wow. Who else? Michael B. Jordan could be good at it. Uh, Daniel Kalua, I think he would yes. be yeah. he's such a chameleon. You know, I think yes. it's, it's going to take a chameleon to play a chameleon. <laughs> I mean, because you've got, you know, dropping weight, gaining weight, you know, just all these different personas. Really, you know, uh, it takes you a while to get a handle on, on Kali. So we're getting um, a few questions about... Um, your strenuous life uh, on camera. So I will jump over to a, um, a question that came in a bit earlier asking when you were on the TV show, Special Ops, what was the hardest part in keeping the participants safe and how they were being tested? And, um, and our guest says, it was amazing how well some of them did with the special skills and you were great mentors to them. So that's very nice. Thank you. How do you keep uh, people safe? You know, we going back to what I touched on yes uh, earlier. You know, was following the same principles and procedures that we follow in the community. You know, mm. in in the real military, in special operations. You know, uh, you, you you brief them not just one time, but you double brief, check, check, and recheck is the saying we have in our community. Uh, you you have fail safes, which means you know you don't just have if something goes wrong. Uh, you don't just have one safety feature on it, but you have another safety feature on it or another safety, you have up to three safety plans in the case something goes wrong. And, you know, you just, you just monitor them. So that, so it wasn't hard to keep them safe at all, you know, um, and then there's cameras all over the, the, the base that we were on. And it, once we go out and we do these tasks, there's cameras everywhere. So everybody is a, is a safety eye, if that makes sense. Well, that is, well, I watched uh, Plane recently and you are very uh, kick-ass in that and it, it's a lot of fun. And so do you do your own stunts? Is it strenuous when you shoot a film like that or is it nothing compared to the real thing? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, I did my stunts for Plane. Um, I did my stunts, well, I didn't do one stunt for Terminal List. Uh, I did, I didn't do all my stunts for Transformers last night. So it, it, it depends on the project, but it's not that bad. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, when you, when you jumped out of planes and done all of the stuff that you do, you know, that's just, uh, it just comes with the territory, but it definitely is not as hard as doing it, doing it for real, you know, because, you know, when you hit the ground on an op for, you know, there is no time out cut, there's, Hey, you got to keep moving. You got to keep going, you know? <laughs> oh my God. That, that, that is an important distinction. Definitely. Um, and so I know you cover this in Transform, but what, what drew you to become a Navy SEAL to enter the Navy? Well, I was, uh, was a film. It, it started with, I would say the inception of it started with story. I grew up in the Bronx 
uh, and a, you know, and in the late eighties, early nineties, crack epidemic was out of control. Um, drug, there was tons of crime. The mafia was very prevalent. I remember being a kid and going into the corner store and seeing the mafia guys with the big collars coming in and shaking down the store owners and collecting tax. There was a guy in my building who did business with the mafia to this day. They haven't found his body. He disappeared like somewhere around 96, 97. So I grew up in a very rough environment and a lot of kids coming from where I, where I came from, uh, you know, either fell into selling drugs, uh, rap music or, or athletics. And I have a friend to this day who I used to sell drugs with who's in prison to this day. And so um, and when I was about 15, I saw a movie called Bad Boys. And uh, that was the first time I saw two African-American men who looked like me and, and they had swagger kind of like me, but they were, they were playing heroes. You know, they, they were still themselves and they were playing heroes. And that was the first time in my mind I said to myself, wow, I can be something other than a drug dealer, athlete, or, you know, or, or, or a rapper. I can be a hero and still maintain who I am. And then about two years later, a film by the name of The Rock came out. And that was my first exposure to Navy SEALs. And I said to myself, if I ever turn my life around, I don't know if I most likely will, will not. <laughs> but if I was to ever turn my life around, I would do that. So um, fast forward to uh, my when I was 19, getting ready to go into 20, I got involved in a deal with a drug dealer that went bad, sold them some products that were supposed to last for a certain amount of time and only lasted for a fraction of that time. My life was threatened. My mom's life was indirectly threatened. That was a huge wake up call for me. And it was then when I decided I need to get out of this place. If not, I'm going to end up dead or in prison. And so, you know, that, that was kind of six months later is when I made the decision to join the Navy and then follow through on my promise that, hey, I'm turning my life around, so I might as well go big or go home and become a fraud man. Now, did you have, did anyone mentor you um, into becoming a SEAL or once you were a SEAL? Yeah, when I would say when I was trying to become a SEAL, they, you know, when, when I finally got into SEAL training, because that was a year process, because I couldn't swim, I didn't have the academic scores and I was really skinny, so I had to, I had to, training to prep to get into training to get into buds and then once you get into buds the instructors they hammer you but at the same time you know because they're trying to weed people out in the class that i graduated with started with 270 29 of us graduated so a big part of the process is to weed out the week but then after that there is ongoing mentorship from the buds instructors and then once you get to your your team your platoon you know the the senior guy the guy who's uh, right above you it does act as a, we call him a sea daddy in the military, but a mentor. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, circling back uh, for a minute um, to Chameleon, because there are interesting real world connections and we always like people's perspective. Um, you've got the, the war in Ukraine has progressed to a conclusion in the book. So what, how did, I mean, it's always dicey when you're dealing with events that are unfolding. So uh, what made you uh, take it in that direction? And, and is that what you really think will happen with Ukraine? Or what, what, do, you, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, it, it doesn't come to a conclusion. I wasn't going to spoil it. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were. Sorry, sorry. It's seeming like it's going to it seems like there's a conclusion and it seems yeah, yeah. and it has not gone well right I, yeah, I, tried to, I wanted to keep it open ended because i didn't I, I knew when the book was going to come out but i didn't know where the war would be so i didn't want to write myself into a corner and then readers are like well that's not what happened so you know um uh yeah i i, I knew that i wanted to have real world but i wasn't in the military you know, I got out in 2016, so obviously I wasn't in the military any time around, you know, the, uh, the Ukraine war or, or, or the Ukraine-Russian world war. So I'm not read right into absolutely anything. Um, um, so there's not, I'm saying that for the record, there's nothing in there that is classified because I didn't know, I just made up what, what the events would be. Um, but yeah, I wanted, I wanted to tie something uh, into the story that people can, can identify with because it's, it's, it's actually happening and ongoing and maybe ask yourself, is this how it's, how it's gonna turn out? 
is this time, maybe is this a solution to fix the problem? Is this not a solution to fix the problem? And so that was that was my inspiration for putting that in there. Well, it was it was always interesting, you know, we do the, you know, alternate histories and you know parallel worlds and and trying to see what was going on. But you have um Van Groot has a really interesting piece of technology that is an essential part of his main evil villain plot. Um, and is that, it, it's really with, the, it's about masking uh, planes. Is that technology that is being worked on? How did you come up with that? I made, I made it up. I have you no- You made it, you just- I had no clue. I was just like, you know what? I don't know if this exists or not. I need to give him a way to get in and out of places. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to write myself into a corner. And so I just figured, how about I just create this device that he puts on the front of a vehicle and uh, it does the rest for him. So uh, yeah, I, I never heard of that technology at all. I just made that. I even made up the name brainwave what's about brainwave that sounds cool <laughs> i like well it um it led uh one of one of my colleagues wants to know did you do you have a spy gadget that you wished that you had had that you wished was real you know uh i would say that gadget that i made up in the chapter that yeah. I read, the nano, uh, the nanoparticle technology. Uh, again, something else that I made up. It's not anything that's classified. It's not anything that I read up on. I was just like, okay, we need to figure out a way to track this guy to this place and do certain things. So, how about man, nanotechnology? <laughs> so, I know, I know. Well, it's yeah. it's it's really it's great to have a great imagination and the people that we know who work in those departments at the agencies and in tech, they have to have great yeah. imagination. So they may want to, oh, they may they, be inspired yeah. by you. And I thought I was just about to say, who knows, they might read the book and be like, oh, that's something cool. Let's create that. <laughs> well, Shauna, Shauna asked me, and this is such a great uh, question. Shauna Altman's on the team. We have um, came up with this for a show about Bond villains, but real spies got to tell their Bond moment. Yeah. And that was when, because a lot of times, now you had a pretty exciting career, but some some folks don't have the most exciting, important spy careers, but maybe not as exciting as James Bond or Remy Adelaide yeah. K. But did you ever, what what's kind of the most incredible moment from your Navy SEAL career when you felt like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm a, I'm an international intelligence operative. And I, you know, the one that comes to mind is, it's not, it's not uh, flashy and, and uh, you know, exciting. I've had some cool ops and got to do a lot of cool things, but it was as simple as I was in Baghdad and Cinco de Mayo, I won't say what year it was, but I had a meeting with some people from a three-letter agency and it was at Saddam's palace that had been turned into a compound for this agency. And um, there was like a like a disco slash bar, but they weren't serving alcohol there because they couldn't because they're in country, but and, and out and and they were these uh these uh, French doors that led out to this stunning pool that was Saddam's old pool. And it was just lit beautifully. And there were palm trees around and the banners around. And it was just beautiful. And again, this, this, this uh, agency had taken over this compound and kind of turned into the, somewhat of a, a base of operations. And I just remember sitting poolside, Cinco de Mayo, sipping Coronas with these two agents and another seal because we went there to meet with them to have a conversation. And I just remember looking around after taking a sip and saying, how? the hell did this happen? <laughs> like, here I am from the Bronx. I was well, born in Nigeria, went to the Bronx, was running from the feds in the Bronx, and now I'm sitting poolside in this country, sipping Coronas with these two, you know, agency guys. And that, I will, that memory will be with me to the day that I die. That was my, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I made it mama moment. <laughs> Well, you clearly, I mean, you have this incredible visual 
descriptive power. And you have a lot of great locations in the book. You know, you took us to the islands for that restaurant. We know about the floating command center. Have you been everywhere that you wrote about or were some of these things that you had to, to research to imagine? Yeah, I know I haven't been out as too many places. No, I, I haven't been everywhere. There's a handful of places here and there I've been to, but uh, for the most part, most of the places I haven't been to. You know, like the oh, old, I haven't been to Brazil. And that, that was one of the, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to, I wrote that opening in Brazil because I never been and I want to go and I so I, I wanted to imagine and do the, re, I wanted to take myself there mentally. <laughs> so doing the research and, uh, and, 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 and writing it really took me there, you know, um, uh, mentally. So I've, I've been there, but just not physically, but I'm hoping to get there. But yeah, I, I want to get to a lot of like South Africa. I, you know, there's, I never got a chance to go to South Africa. I'd love to get there one day as well. So um, there's a, you know, Como Lake. Uh, uh, I've been to Italy. I've been to, uh, I've been to um, uh, a lot of other places in Europe, but I've never been to Switzerland. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely places I want to get to. I like, I like you're taking, you know, you're taking yourself on the trip, not just the audience or not just the reader. Um, so we often get, as, as we're winding down, uh, we often get questions, you know, from younger people about, you know, how to get a career like yours. Well, you have a pretty amazing and diverse career, but what would you recommend to, to younger people if they wanted to become a Navy SEAL or they wanted to go into intelligence work? I would say just do it. Start the process. Do the research. Um, see what it takes to qualify to get into the, pro the programs. If it's the military, you want to get into special operations, whether it's a SEAL or, or uh, Army unit or Marine Corps unit, go online. The information is there as far as what the screening tests uh, require and then also what 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 uh, these programs require academically in the military uh, there's what's called an ASVAP and you know which is similar to the SAT so there's certain ASVAP scores high ASVAP scores you have to get to get into these programs which means if you're in high school you got to do good and you got to pay attention in class because that's going to help prepare you for this test so that you can get the scores that will allow you to get into these specialized programs in the military um, and and you know, again, do your research, figure out what you want and just go do it. And uh, I tell people all the time, uh, you have to have a deep rooted emotional reason as to why you want to do anything. Whether it's be a doctor, whether it's be, you know, whatever the case may be, special forces, CI, whatever. You have to have a deep rooted emotional reason why, because on your journey towards this, towards your dream, you're going to face obstacles. The winds and storms of life are going to try to blow you away and that deep rooted emotional reason why it will anchor you. And you have to hold on to that anchor. Uh, otherwise, you know, you won't make it. And so do the research, have a deep rooted emotional reason why if it's something like the agency, I've never worked for the agency at all um, uh, as a contractor or, you know, directly. Um, so find out what the requirements are and work to meet, not just meet the standard, but blow past the standard, you know, um, when it's time to scream. All right, my last question, and I don't even know if I wanna ask you, but I'm gonna ask you anyway, because I wanna know what keeps you up at night, what scares you, but you have such a great imagination and such a great knowledge. I'm a little scared to find out. I have to tell you what's keeping me up at night is the cat who's trying to get on the laptop right now. <laughs> um, he does keep me up at night, but you know what I meant. What what national security and international issues are keep, keep you up at night? There's two things. There's one is social media and uh, 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 the, the how social media, especially you know apps like TikTok, are uh, targeting our uh, our young people, and, uh, and and intentionally the algorithms are, are are created to target young people in a way that is detrimental to them. And as a matter of fact, we're, we know that uh, the rec recruiting across the board is down, across all the branches services down. And, and you know, it's a part because of the messaging that is going out via social media platforms like TikTok, which, you know, we know TikTok is not an American-based uh, 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 app. 
And so how social media is warping the minds of young people and, and, and keeping and, and making in some cases a lot of young people lazy and, 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 and feeling this need for instant gratification and depressed and all of these things. So that's, the, that's one of the big things is social media. Um, and uh, uh, I deal with that in book two a little bit. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of hint in book two uh, with, our, with our antagonist and he's, you know, and what's going on there. That, that plays a big role in it. I really dive into that. The second thing is AI um, technology. Uh, and, and, and um, you know, obviously I'm a WGA writer, SAG actor. So part of the reason why we're striking is because the studios and streamers want to be able to use AI technology. Uh, and, and in, in some cases that can put us out of work and, 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 and cause a lot more issues, but just how AI is rapidly advancing. And at some point, I'm just worried that it's not going to be controllable. Not saying that it's going to be sentient. I'm, I don't know if that's not possible, but if it's, if it's going to be, if it's not going to be controllable and it's going to, I, this is a, this might be a crazy, this, uh, this is a crazy theory. Uh, so if somebody wants to call me crazy, just heck, I, I'm recognizing that what I'm about to say is crazy. We as human beings, we treat each other so horribly. We, even in our own country, we treat each other horribly. And then we look at other countries against other countries and we look at all that fighting or religion, all this stuff. We just, we just, since the beginning of time, we've been our own worst enemy. And I truly believe that once AI realizes how destructive we are to each other and how much we hate each other at some point the algorithm whatever you call it it's going to put all of this information in the system and what's going to come out the the the, the uh, answer to the equation is going to be if they are like that to each other then what will they do to me Therefore, I must destroy them before they destroy me. And I, again, I know that's a far-fetched idea, and, and but that's what keeps me up at night. The AI and what it could potentially do to civilization, how it could gradually put people out of work, gradually manipulate the financial sector and manipulate certain things, and then gradually with the end goal to you know, rid us from this earth. Well, you're not alone with that fear. I, I wish you were the only one who fretted about that. Now, now I've got three rapid fire questions that just rolled in. Okay, what's your IQ? IQ? You don't have to tell us. I don't know mine, but don't how know. do you <laughs> learn all this stuff? What's your secret? Well, you know, I just, I just love to read. I love to be informed. Um, I learned early on in my career in special operations that I can't just trust what's on the news because I remember being in a country, getting ready to go on a mission and breaking news reports. Special forces guys, go carry out this mission and rescue everybody. And we're all like, we haven't even gotten on the helo yet. So I tried to, I, 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 how do they get this information? One, and two, we haven't even gotten on the helo yet. But now uh, the bad guys are gonna know that we're coming, right? It was just all about, and so I try to read and study different sides and 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 understand different perspectives because one thing that I always try to say is that conversation uh, and study leads to uh, uh, understanding, and understanding leads to unity. So the more I could study, the more I the more I could do well, and I'm, a lot of what I do is self taught too. So, um, so and I'm cramming all these in in the last seconds how did what um why did you choose to become a medic ah uh, that was the job first job i was offered when i passed when i took the asvap and got in the navy <laughs> fair enough I, as and then last and you'll like this one how many books will be in the series in the black box series when will the next books come out when will the films be streaming any well we know Chameleon's out. Yeah, Chameleon's out July 25th. So this upcoming Tuesday, you can pre-order a signed copy. I think you guys are doing signed copies. We got it. We got it at Spy. Okay. So we'll tell you how to get that. And then, and then uh, any idea uh, about the next book? Uh, the next book, I'm moving publishers. So uh, uh, after the book comes out, you know, depending on how it does, that's going to dictate which publisher I move to. 
Um, and so then we'll, we'll hopefully get a really, I'm trying, I want it to be within, you know, the year, not within the year, but at least next year this time, but we'll see. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Remy. This has been an incredible pleasure to talk to you. Um, I've learned a lot. I've enjoyed it so much. We're all looking forward to the, these folks haven't read it yet, but they'll read it. And we're all looking forward to the film. And I want to thank our audience for joining us and let everyone know our next program will be next Thursday at noon Eastern time. It will be a spy chat, that's current affairs with Chris Costa and our special guest, Ambassador Roger Carsten. So come to that, you can sign up for anything on our website. And if you've enjoyed this program or other programs and you'd like to make a donation to the museum to support us, well, we don't mind, we don't mind. You can buy Remy's book, you can donate to the Spy Museum, or just tell, tell folks uh, to watch our programs on YouTube. So take care, Remy. Thank you, you too. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, everybody, for joining. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Take care, or good afternoon, or good day, wherever you are.